I'm going to mask it up because I went kind of heavy on the garlic when I made supper today. <laughs> <laughs> this is the prop. Good evening, everyone, and I'm glad to see you here, even if I can't see you, and hope you can see and hear us all right. Uh, this is the session three of New Moon Stories, and we are actually one day past the new moon because that inconveniently happened on a Sunday, which we couldn't change, so we just changed the date of Monday. And we have two guests scheduled, and one of them is here, and the other one is in deep trouble. <laughs> Kathy McCauley Spencer is joining us from, where are you at the moment, Kathy? I'm in Glace Bay in my kitchen. Glace Bay in your kitchen, yes. I have a fake background behind me. This is the, uh, the Louis Berg Playhouse, where we did a session there before. And, but mine is not live. Kathy has a live background. She has a troll wandering by every few minutes. It's, it's really legitimate. It's her husband, Art. There he is. <laughs> oh, goodness. So we'll, we will, uh, Kathy, instead of three of us, there's two. So I hope you brought lots of material. I do this kind of on the, on the cuff. You tell a story, and it makes me think of the story, and away we go. I do have one or two that yeah, I that's... tell regularly, so... <laughs> We can go with that. Well, I thank you. I thank you for being here because I know you've jumped into the deep end. You're not used to doing this with uh, more than people across the kitchen table from you. So thank you for uh, taking the chance. <laughs> that way, if they boo, I can smack them <laughs> if they're in my kitchen. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Did you want to start off with something, my dear? Oh, okay. I thought I'd tell the story about my uh, one of my son's jobs and how he got it. Um, uh, my husband and I are big travelers, and we, um, we, we, we like to go to the islands. Anyway, our, uh, our oldest son is a bit of a computer geek, and he introduced us uh, to a game called Ingress. Now, Ingress is a world domination game, okay? There's two teams, and they're <laughs> fighting for world domination, and you play it on your cell phone. So you ha it, was, it was the precursor to Pokemon. But anyway, you have to physically go to these places and pick up the digital information and take it back. So we had gone down to Tobago, uh, right? And we were novices. And so we picked up the digital information and we're in the Toronto airport, all right? And the idea is we have to take this digital information on our phone and we have to go to the, we were flying to Halifax just to the airport before we went on to Sydney, and we were going to take this digital information and we we're going to transfer it to our son, okay? So we're, we're not very good about this. It's like, like 5 o'clock in the morning in the Toronto airport, and so we've got our cell phones in front of us, and we're going, okay, we have to, now, are you okay? We're going to, we're going to fly to Halifax. You're going to go down through security. Are you okay with going through security? And he goes, yeah, and I said, so you make the digital drop. Now, it has to be a personal drop because the last one was intercepted. And then you come back through security and we'll go on our way. You realize this can cut off the lines of communication for all of North America. And we can really take over the, you know. And this is in an airport at 5 o'clock in the morning. And we're over our phones and we're talking about digital drops and security and world domination and cutting off lines of communication and everything. And it never occurred to us where or what we were doing. And anyway, if we had been Arab, we might have been arrested or at least questioned. And meanwhile, there's these two guys in the back of us, okay? And you know how you can feel somebody staring at you? So anyway, and they're staring at us. And the, and the two of us turned around and looked at them, and they're glaring at us. And, we've, and then we realized what we were doing. Oh, my God. Like, here we were talking about you know, digital drops and security and everything else like that. And, and we thought, and so we better, you know, go clear this over. So we went over and introduced ourselves and we said, it's a game. Honestly, it's a game. And the guys are like, yeah, sure. And so anyway, <laughs> we talked about it and we showed it to them and everybody. And of course, you can tell how shy I am. So I'm trying to make a relationship with them so they'll know that we're not terrorists. And so I turn around and I say to one of them, I said, so what do you guys, they were, they said that they were stopped on their way from Charlottetown. They got stalled on the way home to Charlottetown from Cuba. And I said, so what do you do in Charlottetown? And one guy said, he's a nurse. And the other guy said, well, to tell you the truth, I'm VP of, um, of manufacturing for a pharmaceutical company. And I went, are you hiring? Out of the blue, and the guy looks at me and goes, well, as a matter of fact, we are. And I said, so what are you hiring? And he goes, well, I'm looking for people with degrees in biology and microbiology. And I said, I have one of those. He's unemployed. 
all right? So I <laughs> pop up the picture of my son and I tell him all his bona fides and the guy's starting to back off now. Might have been better if I was a terrorist. <laughs> so anyway, he says, how about I give you my card and you can get your son to email me his, um, his resume. And I said, sure, I took his card. Well, we weren't out of the airport in, 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 in Halifax when I was, you know, calling my son. So my son sent him the, um, sent him the resume. And from then on, it was on his court. But sure enough, they hired him. And the only reason that he never would have got the job if that guy hadn't thought his parents were terrorists originally. I thought that was pretty cool of a way to be introduced to a new job. So. Good and, beer, uh, good. <laughs> My pe my children, God love them, suffer terribly from my uh, out from me being so outgoing. I can start a conversation with the devil himself. I may have. <laughs> so, I've seen you in action. <laughs> you, I've seen both of you and your troll in action. So yes, I believe you. <laughs> so, my goodness. Well, that was a good first uh, dive into the pool, my dear. Thank you for that. Hmm. I will tell you a story that I heard from uh, Merrill McGinnis. Merrill was our guest on the last session. He was a former fire chief here on the, on the North Shore. And if you've ever taken the ferry from English Town over to um, Jersey Cove, it's about a four or five minute ride. You know, it's not a big deal, but it's not a good swim either. So the ferry's really <laughs> And once you come off the ferry, um, there's a straight stress. It's just, just a shade over two kilometers and it's level and it's clear and you can see who's coming for a long way. And people come off the ferry at different rates of speed. And um, the, the locals know what the road is and they want to get home. The other people, there are also slow drivers and there are the tourists who come off the boats at looking, oh, look at the mountain over there on the left and the ocean. Oh, look, a seagull. And they get very excited and slow. And so the locals will often pass and this happened uh, one time there was a local fella on a motorcycle and he was probably seven or eight back in the lineup and he pulled out to pass there was nobody coming and except that someone else in front of him did the same thing without looking and they hit his motorcycle and knocked him off and he skidded down the road and he died there um, on the road and the family put up one of those pathetic little markers, you know, with the cross and the, and the plastic flowers and just a, just a sad thing altogether. And Merrill was the fire chief and about a year later he got a call saying, there's, chief, there's a, there's a car in the, in the water at the ferry. He thought, that's not good because on the channel side it's, uh, it's deep and the current will run 15 knots in there. That's all he knew was there was a car in so he raced down to the ferry and it wasn't on the channel side, it was on the bay side and it was a station wagon just in shallow water, just up to the wheels, you know, uh, so nobody was hurt. Um, but the station wagon had done the same thing, came off the ferry, eight or nine back in the line, pulled out to pass, someone else pulled out without looking and knocked them into the bay and the car went right over the marker where the bike, motor biker had died last the year before. And they got everybody out safe and they were taking down information and it turned out the driver of the station wagon was the brother of the motorcyclist who was killed the year before. Oh my. Woo woo woo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a fairy story With the fairy story than that. The, the head of that doesn't have any woo-woo in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we have some time to go yet. <laughs> I will mention that uh, our other guest, our other guest uh, storyteller, John Hamilton, has not arrived and may not. So if one of the people in the peanut gallery would like to join in, we're glad to have you contribute to uh, your stories. Just, you see the chat um, symbol on the bottom? You just uh, type a little note to uh, to Tara at CBRL and tell her you've got something you'd like to contribute. We would be glad to have you in, by all means. Maybe I'll do a short little little bit of a merrier one before we go away there. I, the last session we told about the the Lebanese trader from uh, from Sydney. He used to come up on the North Shore. He'd load his pack with with articles for sale, and. Uh, 
I heard somebody that actually knew of him and he eventually opened a store in Sydney. I'd like to know more about that. But I told the one story in Bedeck at the library and uh, Shirley Heffern said, I have one about the same guy. She said he was, he went to the house to the old couple and she said, neither of them had ever seen a hand mirror before. So she, the, the traveler had a, a hand mirror. He gave it to the old fellow and he looked at it and said, that's my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and his wife took it and looked at it and said, you old fool, that's not grandfather, that's my grandmother. for the applause to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, you're frozen. Have I lost my signal? Yes, you're, you're a little, yeah. 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 You know, that's, the storytellers in my family go way back. I remember my grandfather and that's who, like, because they, they tell the stories over and over again because they didn't have the entertainment that they did. One of my grandfathers, one of the stories I remember my grandfather telling is that he had um, he ha he had had a friend, and this friend had had said that he was the cheapest man in Cape Breton. All right, and anyway, and my grandfather and the, this fellow had heard that there was another guy cheaper than him in Marguerite. So anyway, his um, his friend walked all the way to Marguerite because you wouldn't spend the money on a you know on a, a horse or a cat, you know, or go with somebody, he walked all the way. So he walked all the way to Marguerite and he went into this guy's house that was supposedly cheaper and they talked and they talked. And of course, the, it got to be dark and the guy didn't turn the light on and anything because of course he was too cheap to pay for the oil for a, our kerosene for a lamp. And then my grandfather's friend heard this, this, nap, this noise and he said, well, what are you doing? And, you know, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm taking off my pants so I don't wear through the seat of my pants. And my, grandfather's <laughs> and my grandfather's friend got up because he figured that there was no way he would ever be as cheap as a guy who would take his pants off, not to wear them out. <laughs> uh, one of my fondest memories is listening to my grandfather and some of his cronies um, over tea and coffee in the evenings, just telling stories. Not that I, I wish I had taped them at the time. So. Hmm. I have one that I heard from someone on the North Shore here and, and uh, she told it to me and I said, I really like that story. Do you mind if I, if I tell it? Oh, I kind of like to keep it to myself, she said. Well, that's fine. So I respected that until I heard the same story from two other different people also in the first person. So I thought, well, we're probably in public domain here, so I'll pass that on. So the story is that there's always been traffic between Cape Breton and what they call the Boston states um, with young people going to work. So there's, there's lots of uh, commerce back and forth. And the two couples were going to Boston for a visit, leaving from, from North Shore here. So they left early and the one couple about 4.30 in the morning drove to the other house pulled in the driveway and the woman came out, walked to the car, got in the back seat and closed the door. Where's Arnold? In there, drunk. They went in and got Arnold and persuaded him into the back seat, strapped him in and he fell asleep. And he stayed asleep all the way to the US border in Maine. And they got through customs and he, he was awake. He said, I'm hungry. All right, Arnold, we'll get you some breakfast. I don't want breakfast, I want lobster. You want lobster at nine o'clock in the morning. I want lobster. So they took him to where he could uh, he could get a lobster and he ordered and he was looking contented and then the, the food came and the lobster only had one claw. He looked at the lobster and he looked at the server and said, this, this fellow's only got one claw. She says, well, you know, sometimes in the tank they get into fights and one of them will lose a claw. Arnold picked the plate, handed it to her, and you take this fella back and bring me the winner. <laughs> <laughs> Tara, do you want to speak for a moment about uh, about the program and anything else you want to unveil? 
Yeah, sure, sure thing. Thanks there, Bill. Um, I just, I'll re-mention, so even though you said it, that if folks have a comment or a question for Kathy or Bill, um, or if you yourself have a story you'd like to share, we can um, take your mute off and your video off if you're interested. So maybe just let me know in the chat box that Bill had mentioned about. And the other thing I just thought I'd share is um, it, how wonderful it is that Bill has organized these um, Zoom story sessions. So my job at the library is programming. And um, that certainly has um, seen a decline since COVID because our public spaces just aren't what we, we know them to be. Um, so I, I have to thank him very much for um, kind of um, going out there and trying this new um, this new format and, and working out the kinks and just uh, making it um, as what it can be at, at this time. And, and I still, I feel it strikes an awesome balance because it's still us, it's still stories and it's still um, with the community who are interested in sharing. So I want to just thank Bill. Um, but the library also um, has done a lot to move some things online. So um, there are just three things I'll mention. Um, press reader. So with your library card and going onto your, um, our website, um, it's access to newspapers and magazines. And there's another platform, it's called RB Digital. And it's again, thousands of magazines that you get for free um, with your library card. So you just have to sign in and maybe create a password and use your library card and you can access those. Um, and then the other thought that I should share is we did revamp our website and um, the previous New Moon Stories, so New Moon Stories 1 and New Moon Stories 2, you can find links to those on our webpage. So yeah, I think that was all I was going to share. Am I missing anything? I use the article. No, I don't think so. It's wonderful. And I guess I just have a little message. Um, from Charlotte. Yes. Okay, so um, from Charlotte, she could tell a war story or a Christmas story. And she says, it's your choice. Sure, come on in. Yeah. Charlotte, um, are you ready? Could I open, um, could I open your video now? So we, we are recording as well. And if you're uncomfortable with the recording, I could pause. Um, um, or we could just edit it out after the fact. All right. I didn't get any message. Hi. Oh, it's, oh, Hi. you're Charlotte. <laughs> yes, it's me. It's Charlotte's, I just put two and two together. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Charlotte set up the computer, and uh, no, because her name is there. She set it. She set it up for me, and then she took off. And um, anyway. Oh, thanks for including me. I would have taken me a long time to figure out I was supposed to open your video. I didn't put two and two together there. Thanks for joining. Oh, so run all the back. I get to be Earth. It makes sense that he gets to be Charlotte. Yes, that's hey, right. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what is your choice, that Christmas story or the war story? You don't have a Christmas war story? <laughs> Christmas war story. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're quite different. The Second World War and Christmas, two different things. <laughs> I'll start with one, Ronald, and we'll see where it goes. I will just mention that Ronald was the second storyteller in residence uh, for Cape Breton Library, and he preceded me. So I'm wearing his moccasins at the moment. Okay, it's going to be the Christmas story then, because I had started, started to write this up for the uh, the latest um, Cape Breton uh, book of Christmas and uh, didn't quite get into uh, this year's book. So um, this is a first. Okay. 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 And it uh, goes back to my younger days when uh, me and a buddy uh, during the Christmas holidays. Uh, when you're like a in your late teens, Christmas holidays are not too exciting in general. And um, we're doing a school project on Mexico. So we thought, hey, why don't we just go down to Mexico for the Christmas holidays? And uh, back then it was a different world. There were people who would put an ad in the newspaper um, saying that they're driving to Mexico for the winter and uh, uh, they had room in their car if you wanted to share gas. So we answered the um, uh, the ad and we got a lift and we stuffed things into our backpacks and off we went to Mexico. 
and we landed in Mexico without a clue, really. And uh, we survived the trip, but there were, I won't go into all the details. It was a very harrowing experience with uh, my friend getting his uh, backpack stolen with all his gear one night when we were sleeping on a beach. And I was in trouble there because my sister had lent him her backpack. So that's the, the backpack that was stolen. And anyway, we, we, we struggled back somehow. But to get, give it a little Christmas feel, we did stop in, Quebec, in uh, Mexico City where the, um, uh, the Christmas celebrations there, the Spanish style was very different. Uh, what they had in the city parks in Mexico City were the three wise men. People dressed up in very elaborate costumes like the, as the three wise men wandering through the parks and families would go into the park and uh, the wise men would uh, give little candies to uh, children, hand out uh, gifts like that. I thought that was really neat that they had their own like very different kind of Spanish Christmas tradition down there. So that was Christmas in Mexico. But um, coming back, you see, we had we had a lift down there. Didn't know how we were going to get back, though. That was just a, you know, we'd, we're, we'd figure out a way of getting back. Well, we, we ended up, the only way we could afford to come back was by bus all the way from the Mexican oh. border all the way back to Montreal. Long ride. And during the first day or night, it, it all became a blur at one point. The bus driver pulled into a little diner. This was in Oklahoma. And we, it's late in the evening and uh, we stop at the diner to, uh, it, it was quite cool. It was, the weather was getting quite cold up there. And um, so we go in and sit along this long counter and there was this one fellow who got off the bus there who was the typical Oklahoma cowboy. He looked like someone who had just come off the set from Bonanza, complete with the big cowboy hat and everything. And this perky young waitress comes along with a coffee pot. And she says, can I give you something to warm you up? So this big cowboy, he looks up at her. And I'm sitting there like, half days when the, we'd been traveling since the Mexican border and we're somewhere way in Oklahoma in the middle of nowhere. And I look at the guy, he's looking up at the waitress and he says, warm me up one time. Now, I have to explain that down in the Southern States, they don't say once, twice the way we do here. They say one time, two times. So he looks at the waitress and says, warm me up one time. And she kind of looks at him and she says, yeah, you want some coffee to warm you up? She looked kind of a little panicky there. And it was just such a funny, funny scene that uh, I never forgot that. <laughs> and anyway, we made it back home. And ever since then, I've always wanted to go into a cafe sometime <laughs> and, uh, on a cold day and walk in and go up to the counter and say, warm me up one time. <laughs> So that's my Christmas story for what it's worth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ronald. Yes. <laughs> Talk about Americanisms. I remember um, I traveled a lot in the South when I was trucking and, and uh, where we say pardon or excuse me or could you repeat that, the expression was do what now? <laughs> Which doesn't make any sense to me at all, but oh well, as we say, c'est la vie en soupe de jour. <laughs> Kathy, are you ready? Oh, um, I was thinking about your comment about the woo-woo earlier, and I have a forerunner story. Um, the woo-woo ah. runs really strong in our family. Um, uh, my father-in-law was psychic, and um, it's just things tend to happen. But my uncle, who I loved dearly, um, he, uh, he used to come to visit me in the morning, okay? He, uh, the kids would go off to school, and anyway, I'd be up making the beds and getting things ready for the day. And he'd come, he'd come on the back door, into this back door, and he'd open and close the door, he'd walk up the three steps, 
he would pull out the chair and sometimes he'd get up and he'd put the kettle on, put the kettle on. Now he never said anything, he never knocked or anything else, but I knew around quarter after nine in the morning, there he would be. So anyway, he had ended up with surgery and so he hadn't been for, hadn't been for like almost two months. And one day he, again, he comes and I was so pleased to see him. He comes in the back door, up the three steps and I can hear him upstairs. So that's fine. Two or three days later, I hear him come in, open the back door opens. I hear the three steps coming up into the kitchen. I hear the, I hear the chair come out and then I don't hear anything. So I came downstairs and there was nobody there. And I looked up the back porch, I looked up and down the road, there was nobody there. And I thought, you're hearing things. When his wife came home that night, they found him dead in the basement. Wow. He had come to say one last goodbye. And because that is quite sad, and it just, but I always felt so special because he had come to say goodbye. But I will tell my fairy story on top of that, because... It's just, um, I was telling this yesterday. Um, they were talking about police and everything else like that. My ha we have four children, okay? And most of my kids' stories are about my four children. We had gone over with the four kids to PEI for the weekend, including our two-year-old who got very car sick, okay? They were aged between the ages of two and 12. So um, Labor Day dawns, it's a gorgeous hot day and we think, okay, you know, we have to go home today and we get to the ferry and here it was Gold Cup weekend and the next ferry is full. So we have driven an hour with four kids in the hot weather and then we get to the ferry terminal and we're at the ferry terminal for an hour and a half with four kids under the age of 12 and then we have been on the ferry for an hour and a half. So it's been approximately four and a half hours since we've left home and we're still in Picto. Okay, and you can imagine the kids had been hot and it's been cranky. So we were coming off the ferry ramp, all right? We were coming off the ferry ramp and they start punching each other in the backseat. And one says he's hitting me and everything else. So anyway, we come down the ramp and there's this, there's this truck that you know was going for the Newfoundland ferry. And my husband didn't want to get caught behind him. So we passed that and he keeps going. He put the metal so far down and the kids are punching each other in the backseat. And Anna had just started to howl when we saw the lights in the rear view window. And so anyway, and my husband looks at me and he says, and he's making all these excuses, okay? I said, Art, you were speeding, all right? You're just going to have to take your medicine. So we pull over and Anna's screaming in the background and the kids are punching each other and they're howling, why are we stopping? I thought we we're going home. And, and when Art rolls down the window, the Mountie steps back because there's that much noise coming out of the van. And Art turns and he, look, and he turns and he looks at the Mountie and he's got this hang dog look in his face and the man he was probably in his mid 50s and he looked at him and he goes you're not going to get home anymore fa any faster by speed <laughs> anyway he gave him a warning and let him go but god love him i think the man he was just so pleased that he didn't have to go home with us <laughs> but anyway uh yeah. so. <laughs> lovely well, in the first two um, New Moon sessions, I ended up doing, I've always loved storytelling through rhyming poetry. I was a Robert Service fan from forever. Actually, I remember going to my high school in, my old high school in uh, Carton Place, Ontario, to do a writing workshop. And I mentioned uh, the, tell me the guy's name, Robert Service, blank. Not a not a not a flicker of recognition anywhere. I said to the teacher, "Don't don't they know about this?" He said, "Oh, they wouldn't be interested." And I did not shoot him. I think only because I wasn't armed at the time. But <laughs> I have uh, I've always enjoyed uh, rhyming poetry. So the story behind this one is that our friend uh, Kate, who runs a Bedeck Library branch, was uh, setting up a children's program with a volunteer who wanted to do a story about a goose. And she said, I searched high and low. I could not find the children's story where the goose lived. <laughs> Go tell Aunt Rhoda the old gray goose is dead. You know, Christmas time is coming and the goose is in the pan. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I wasn't in time for that, but I thought this is, this is a challenge that I can rise to. So I have written this, a poem called The Great Adventure of Stephanie Goose. Average might be the way to describe the essence of Stephanie Goose. Not short, not tall, not skinny, not fat, 
not rich, not poor, not tight, not loose. Her feathers were sort of a medium gray. She was neither clever nor dumb. Of course, she had some friends at school, but not as many as some. When other students were puzzling hard, working out a riddle, she wouldn't be first, nor would she be last. She'd be the one in the middle. But Stephanie Goose had a special trait that set her apart from the crowd. Whenever she opened her beak to honk, goodness, that girl was loud. When she let loose, grown men cried. Elephants ran amok. She made more noise than a diesel train or 170 ducks. It's a wonderful gift, she said, I suppose, though I sometimes wish I could lose it. It came with me on the day I was hatched. I wasn't the one to choose it. Quiet and calm for Stephanie Goose was the ideal state of affairs, but once in a while things went wrong and people were caught unawares. Like everyone else, when startled or scared, she sometimes let out a squawk that stopped the traffic, frightened the dogs, and halted the town hall clock. Passing pigeons fell from the sky. Trees would tremble and shiver. To get away from the terrible noise, kitty cats jumped in the river. Saturday morning, half past nine, two boys were down by the bay. Holy cow, said Marty McLean, the water's all going away. The boy was right. They looked to the east a kilometer or more. Nothing but seaweed and mud and rocks on the empty ocean floor. Johnny McDonald was close to tears, though he tried his best to be brave. You know what it means, he said to McLean. We're going to get a big wave. Sure enough, a long ways out, the massive wave started to build. We have to warn the town, said Johnny, or everyone's going to be killed. They took to their heels and ran for the, turned around and took to their heels, yelling up Main Street and down. It's coming, it's coming, run for your lives, run away or be drowned. The townsfolk heard the hollering boys and saw the great wave coming. Head for the hill, shouted the mayor, and everyone took off running. To the top of the hill, the townsfolk ran and were met by the clerk of the court. He counted them once, counted them twice, and still came up one short. Someone is missing, he said to the mayor, and as nearly as I can deduce, everyone is accounted for but poor little Stephanie Goose. There she was, down by the shore, standing alone on the dock. Oh my goodness, said Nurse McCray, I think the poor girl is in shock. And so she was, thunderstruck, watching the incoming wave. Just before it hit the shore, something finally gave. Stephanie Goose was terribly frightened, scared like never before. A second before the wave scooped her up, she let out a terrible roar. The newspapers published first-hand accounts from people on top of the hill. They said that Stephanie's honk was so loud, the echoes are echoing still. Little children were knocked for a loop. Bears went and hid in their caves. But the most remarkable thing of it was the effect that it had on the wave. It's the strangest sight I've ever seen. I've lived here for many a year. When Stephanie honked, that gigantic wave all at once just disappeared. That's not it at all, said Connor McLeod. She stood like a warrior knight with a wave of her sword and a battle cry. She chased the thing clean out of sight. Differ told the town of how events came into play, but on one detail they all are agreed. Stephanie Goose saved the day. Once in a while she's given a squawk, she still has the town folks' affection, and everyone carries in pocket or purse some kind of hearing protection. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Lovely. Is there anyone else on the side with a with a tail? Yeah, no, I'm watching and I, I haven't seen anyone add, but now is your time. <laughs> If you have something you'd like to share, I think you just need to let us know in the chat box first, and uh, that way we'll um, turn on your video. Or, like Ronald, you could turn on your video <laughs> um, <laughs> and then join us, because I either, I wasn't going to find him as Charlotte, that's for sure. Yeah, you can use a false name if you like. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's right, that's until you have to show yourself, yeah. <laughs> um, I have a story about a duck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> following the, the story about the goose. I had, a girl, I had a girlfriend that was an avid uh, uh, bird watcher, okay? And anyway, she ended up having to have surgery one day. And so I took her home to her house 
and um, got her supper and everything, but she had had painkillers and she was as loopy as you could get. So anyway, <laughs> we're, we're sitting and, and she's watching television and I'm reading a book. And then all of a sudden she looks at me and she says, get the duck. <laughs> I went, yeah. And I smiled and she goes, she got quite insistent, get the duck. And anyway, and, I'm fine. and then finally it was like, get the duck. And so anyway, I started to leave the room and I heard a duck. I thought, where the heck is the duck? What am I going to do with the duck when I find it? And I'm going out into, and anyway, and I turn around and I can hear the duck and I'm wondering what I'm going to do. And there on the table was her cell phone. It quacks like a duck when her <laughs> husband calls. <laughs> I got the duck. <laughs> Kind of funny. <laughs> oh, speaking of ducks, this is the story about a horse. <laughs> I said this before too. I think when uh, um, Hector McNeil and I did a, a session at the Louisville Playhouse, you were there at that, Kathy. But Hector said afterwards, he said, "I came with ten or twelve stories ready, and and only did two of them." Because could you'd say something about a horse, and I'd think of something about a horse, and on it went from there. But this one, I think it might have been him or it, either him or Angus McLeod that I heard this one from. It was a fella from from uh, Truro, and he bought a bought a horse from a guy in uh, down around Port Hawkesbury, Cape Breton horse. And they differed like two old farmers for a while and settled on a price and. Uh, the, the seller said, no, he's a good horse, but there's one thing I want to tell you. When you give him water, just give him the one bucket of water. That's all. Don't don't ever do more than that. And the buyer thought, well, that's kind of strange, but oh well. Because he knew horses all right, you know. So he took the horse home, and it was a good horse. It was clever and hardworking, and everything was just fine. And this one day in the spring, they were working in the woods, hauling logs out for firewood, and and they'd started early and went late and they were all kind of, both kind of tired. So came back and he fed and watered the horse, gave him a bucket and he slurped the first bucket down and looked at the guys anymore. And he said, well, yeah, what the heck, you had a, a good day, I'll give you another one. So he gave him another bucket of water and he had no more than finished it. And the horse started rear up, rearing up on his hind legs and kicking the stall and roaring and trying to bite. and just went right off the planet. And the guy said, this, I've never seen this in a horse before. It took him a long time to get calmed down. And, and uh, he finally said, I, I'm, hmm, I'm going to phone this, the seller. He phoned him the next morning and said, Some, this went on with his horse yesterday. He just went crazy all of a sudden. Said, Did you remember what I told you about the one bucket of water? Yes. Did you give him two? Yes. Well, he's a Cape Breton horse. You give him two drinks and all he wants to do is fight. <laughs> My husband says I should tell you the story about the cougar. Oh, man. Uh, since we're on the animal theme. Um, this is an animal. Good. Pardon? It's an animal, yes? Yes. Well... Good. I had never heard of a cougar any other way but an animal. Yeah, okay. So my husband was working. I, I honestly, it has a lot to do with the cougar being an animal. So anyway, my husband, uh, my son was working at the wildlife park out at Two Rivers. And my husband was on vacation. And, and we had company at the house, a young couple that were uh, my nephew and his wife. And so my husband left in the morning. And he drove um, our son to work. Well, we had, um, he wasn't coming back and he wasn't coming back. And, and so finally my nephew said, what happened to Art? And I said, well, I said, well, after he drops um, our, uh, our son off, he likes to go, go visit the cougar. And the woman said, and she, he, they said, a cougar? I said, well, well, yeah, he likes to visit the cougar. He does every morning. Um, anyway, her name's Sabrina. <laughs> and they were laughing and they started to laugh and I said, uh, they said, you have a problem with this? I said, no, she's getting old. He brings her a cheat. She said, he can really make her purr. And so anyway, she likes to be rubbed behind the ears. Well, by this time that they were on the floor laughing so hard, 
but there used to be an old cougar <laughs> at the park that he went and visited. He could even scratch her ears behind it. But by the time I got out, the, they I didn't know that a cougar was anything else but an animal. <laughs> animal. But by the time they, they were laughing too hard to tell me. <laughs> anyway, Art loved his cougar. <laughs> That's a memorable way to learn the new use of the word. Yes. Mm. Speaking of cougars, <laughs> story about a bobcat. <laughs> and this one we heard from uh, Johnny McDonald, Johnny the Cook. Um, on the North Shore, people for years and years were into subsistence farming, and that's all. They, they had their crops, and they cut their own wood, and they, they would fish in the summer and haul the crops in. and. Uh, a lot of stuff was by barter, and they grew most of their food and traded for what they, they didn't have, and didn't have a nickel most of the time to, to spend. And the only way they'd get cash money was by trapping in the winter. And they used to trap in pairs. And these, these two fellas, Angie Tom was one, and uh, Neil Roddy McDonald was the other. He's, uh, I don't know if you know Stuart, but it's Stuart's grandfather. But they went trapping. They had a. They had their lines about six miles out back of the rear, back little rear little river. So they go out of the snowshoes and they built a little shack there, and they had a Dutch door on it, a top and bottom, because there was so much snow. Of course, you, they couldn't get the door open. So in the winter, they just open the top half and crawl in. So they left one morning and went out there and and got to the cabin crawled in and started the fire to warm it up and then they went off and uh, I think Angie Tom went on the south trap line and uh, and uh, Neil Riley went east and he came back first and he got a bobcat in the trap and it was frozen solid the legs sticking out it looked like a table that had fallen over on its side you know so he took it in the house and in the shack and put it on the table and then he went out to get some more firewood and a bit later, Angie Tom came back from his his uh, trap line, and they went in the shack, and he looked at the bobcat, and the bobcat looked back at him. It wasn't dead after all. And I don't think the bobcat had much to do with trappers' cabins, but it knew this wasn't a good place to be, so it went looking at some speed for a way out and it started running around and around the shack and kicking down pots and pans and making an awful racket. And about this time, Neil Roddy came back and said, what's going on in there? Don't open the door for God's sake, she'll get out. So he's watching the coop going around. He starts to see a pattern and, and says, all right, I got it now. And, and when the cougar came around the corner, he up to the lake, the stove wood and knocked it right into the middle of next week. And, that was the end. And they skinned it right there, just in case. <laughs> so they had a, a, a pelt to sell and a story that I'm telling you now, 80 yeah. years later. Yeah. And the subtext of this is when I auditioned to be storyteller in residence first um, in 2011, I told that story and I didn't get hired. And I think it's because the animal died. But the the next time I have told a story about four sailors drowning, and that was okay. <laughs> huh. I'm looking for volunteers. I'm looking for I know, hands. I know. You're doing a great job. This is, I don't see any, and I'm, sometimes I get a little nervous that I don't uh, scroll down, but uh, there's no one else who's um, messaged or done the Zoom, Zoom group chat, so... Yeah. I have a little fireman story from Bedeck. You know, volunteer firefighters, they're, they, they are volunteers and they're people who live in the community and they're all shapes and sizes and ages. We have a guy on the North Shore here who's probably 80 and he's been a fireman for years. And there's the firemen in Bedeck um, raised some money for new uniforms and they had a, a big meeting when the uniforms were delivered and and the representative was handing them out by calling the names. And um, I think probably one of the smallest firemen would have been uh, the lawyer, Dan Jason. And he's, he's maybe, maybe five, five or so, but still, you know, he can, he can handle a hose like anybody else. And the other end of that extreme is, is my friend Harvey. And Harvey's probably six, three, if he's not 300 pounds, then check with him next week, big boy. 
So the, the rep is at this meeting and he's calling out the names and handing the uniforms. And he called Dan's name at five foot four and Harvey stood up at six three. And the, the salesman looked at the uniform and he looked at Harvey and he said, I think I have a problem. <laughs> Kathy, you have a story that I that I read uh, that you sent me, and it was about. Well, I won't tell you what to say, but if you don't have an idea for you, I do. Well, what story? Uh, about someone stealing food or trying to steal food. Oh, most of my most of my stories are about our our, um, our kids. And I swear that my, the second one is the meat in my sandwich because it's always the meat that makes it interesting. So anyway, Colin liked his food. Colin liked his food from the time. Colin is our middle boy and he liked the food from the time he was young. And anyway, and he was like, he was three and he's saying, I'll have that nice peak center and everything so anyway <laughs> so one day we were having supper and uh and so anyway he, Colin was a little slow and, and we were trying to move it along and so anyway so my husband makes um a thing with his with his hand you know the spider and he goes a big fat spider's gonna get your dinner and the next thing you know Colin had taken the fork and he had pinned him to the to the table there was no way that the big fat spider's going to get his dinner and and some i swear i used to tell people that if um they could use my kids as birth control because my goodness we had a day i thought anybody was thinking that it'd be fun to have a baby out to come to our place or some roundabout supper time so but it, it's it's really interesting now i'm um for instance, our, our daughter, now she's tough as nails. I swear she has three older brothers and she believes that male are a lesser form of the species and she has three brothers as proof, okay? She's no bigger than a minute and she lives in downtown Toronto and I swear if somebody tried to mug her, they get an awful surprise. But when she was, but when she was little, okay, well, it's just, well, and the boys, she was always, she was never big enough or smart enough or strong enough. So there was one night, she we were all sitting at supper and the boys said that they were going to go up to Daniel's to play and they were going to play road hockey. And anyway, and Anna, you know, four or five years old, can I play too? And they said, yes, you can. And I was in shock because they never voluntarily took their sister anyway so that's fine I thought isn't that nice they're going to play with the younger sister so Daniel and Neil went up to the neighbors and they're all going to play road hockey and the next thing you know I get a call from the neighbor and she said did you say it was okay for Anna to play road hockey and I said yes isn't that nice she said well they dressed her up in goalie gear and now they're taking pot shots at her <laughs> so it was just she was also very she really liked the, the the television show the big comfy couch so anyway um and i don't know if you know about the big comfy couch but at the end of the thing the, 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 the molly i think her name was used to they used to do a 10 second tidy and what they used to do was to um she stuffed everything in the big comfy couch 10 second tidy she'd stuff it all into the couch and it was done so anyway so that's fine and it was about three or, or three or so, and we kept on losing things. The weirdest things would disappear. At one point, um, they were counting Sobeys receipts. To you got up to a certain amount, and the Sobeys would give you a dollar for how many receipts you collected. And I had volunteered to count the receipts because the boys would love to use a calculator. And so anyway, so that's fine. And the Sobeys receipts disappeared. Who takes Sobeys receipts? And there would be, you know, a flashlight light would disappear and there would be change and everything else so one day our our oldest son liked to play video games and he would go down on the couch and he would play the video games jumping up and down on the couch all right palliser actually has a guarantee against springs and we had to have them replaced twice so he's jumping <laughs> up and down on the couch and we could hear this funny noise and so anyway so fine we put and anna comes down over the stairs and we're pulling the couch cushions out and she starts to screech and anyway turn the cushion cuts out we start bouncing we still hear the noise and then we pulled everything that we had been missing out of the couch and she oh. depleted her stash oh, yeah. <laughs> 
but we also, <laughs> I have the story of the day that time stood still, okay? Now, time can never stand still, but I can tell you that everybody that was there that day agreed that time stood still. I had the four kids, and in the summertime, my niece and my nephew, um, first my sister kids, and then my brother's kids, my bro uh, the other way around, my brother's kids, and they would come for the summer, and sometimes they would come on grading day, and they wouldn't leave until September. And anyway, my youngest, um, my youngest nephew, he was just, he was so small, and the teenagers just figured he was fresh meat, okay? And so, all summer long, they tormented him. Anyway, one day I woke up and I heard this ungodly scream. And my older son, you know, the rage with Beanie Babies? Well, my older son had had a trial that had sentenced two of Parker's baby Beanie Babies to death by hanging. It was just <laughs> unbelievable the way they had tormented that poor young fellow. Well, we had a rule at the bungalow. You weren't allowed to push anybody off the wharf. It was for safety reasons. Now you have to make exceptions. And they were allowed to push somebody off the wharf with permission. Okay, I know that sounds a little weird. So anyway, Parker is all dressed up in his traveling clothes. It's his last day and he's going home. And he comes up and he looks at me with these big eyes and he says, Aunt Kathy, can I push Colin off the wharf? <laughs> And I looked and I said, yes, darling, you can push Colin off the wharf. So he goes down and Colin's, you know, your 12-year-old cool, he's at the wharf and everything. And anyway, the next thing you know, Colin, he pushes um, Colin off the wharf. And that's when everybody, uh, we're all lined up because we're going to watch Par Parker get his revenge. And we're all lined up on the, uh, the bungalow lawn and Colin is spread eagled in front of the water and time stood still. His arms are like this, and all of a sudden, time stood still. He's up above, and he's suspended among the water, and his arm shoots out. He grabs Parker, pulls him in, and time started getting into the water he goes. Good <laughs> still. And everybody is like, did you just see that? It was so cool. But what, some of the, but what some of the kids used to do, for instance, we're out, we're out on the end of the wharf and we're all talking with all the little kids all in a row. And we're talking about what they're going to be, be when they grow up. Okay. And I laughed as again, and I said, Colin's going to be, um, he's going to be an engineer in a fireworks factory. And all the kids started, they laugh and they said, yes, making napalm. And my first reaction was, how does a five-year-old know what napalm is? And I turned and I looked at them and I said, Main, making napalm? And anyway, and they all scattered. They're all gone. And there was another mother there. And I turned and I looked at and I said, I think the boys made napalm. And she said, they wouldn't do that. So anyway, so that's fine. About 20 minutes later, half an hour, two boys came up, Parker, um, uh, uh, Colin and his best friend Taylor are walking up the wharf. And anyway, and uh, my friend looks at them and says, how was the napalm experiment? And they looked at us and they said, it was so cool. They actually had made napalm. So, yeah, that's what happens. We had a cottage with no uh, no television for the whole summer, <laughs> so they amused themselves in the most interesting ways. So, I can tell I can tell another story about rockets. We used to make rockets, you know, and at first you bought the kits. And then we started making them out of like um, paper towel rolls and they used the pop cans to cut and make the nose. And then we put a motor in it. And then they started putting things. And of course, our, um, my nephew was a little bit more inventive than most. And uh, so they sh the rockets would shoot like 600 feet up in the air and then, you know, whatever. And they started putting little, they put little guides on it and everything. So one day they, um, they put a don't ask me. Um, my nephew's um, grandfather used to loan his own shells. So they made a rocket and they put a gunpowder payload in it. Okay. So the next thing you know, the thing goes, so they shoot the gun, they shoot the rocket off and it goes 600, it gets about 200 feet of the air, the possible 600, and one of the stabilizers goes off. So anyway, it goes straight up and then it goes half a, you know, like half a kilometer down the shore. And I guess that there were these tool guys sitting at a picnic table having a beer or two. And so anyway, they're sitting there and the next thing you know, there's rocket lands, tunk. And then you hear about a second, you go boom. And then you hear again, another five seconds, and it goes boom. And the next thing you know, there's just two, there's two old guys, 
walking up the side of the shore in, the, in Myra, and they've got a rocket in one hand and a can of beer in the other. So <laughs> we took the two youngest kids and sent them down to meet them and said, how far did it go? <laughs> but anyway, so they can tell you. And most some of the stories I still don't hear until now. So anyway, I'm sure they're going to be telling their grandchildren about the fireboats they had out Myra. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. We have a, our house is, has a flat roof and it's uh, we replaced the ones after we got here, but um, road roofing is, is not a, you know, it's not easy to, to find and it's not easy to do. So we hired a company two years ago to do the roof and there were four of them came in the crew and uh, Dean was the foreman and he's one of these little skinny guys and you wonder if he eats it all. He got two teeth and smokes nonstop. And he's the foreman because he'd been there longest. And the next fellow was uh, Norman, was was the guy who, he was, uh, you know, sort of 40-ish, well-built. He smoked too, but but he was uh, he was the guy who got everything done. And he, they had two other guys who were warm bodies just out of high school, first job, you know. And uh, and Norman was in charge. He was a good fellow, knew what he was doing, got, got stuff up on the roof, and uh, they were doing the torch down and all this stuff. But Norman, it appears, was terminally afraid of snakes. And there was a little bitty tiny garter snake just born somewhere around here, down on the grass. Norman saw it and he took off running as fast as he could go off into the other end of the property. Oh, I think you stopped on us, Bill. We lost him. We lost him. Oh, oh, there. We can't hear you, but okay. Here we go. Let's see if I can fix you. There. Oh, you got are it. Back. Okay, yes. I'm back. So Norman ran off to the to the edge of the woods as fast as he could go, and the other the two kids are just ragging on and saying, uh, "Big tough Norman, scared of a little tiny snake." Ha ha ha. And. Um, so he made his way back gradually and he went back to work. And then one of the young fellows who was, was really been picking on him went over to pick up a roll of roofing and he hefted it up. There's there are three inch, three foot rolls of, of roofing, weigh about 45 pounds, picked it up, took two steps, and then he screamed. And if you didn't see him, you'd think it was an eight year old girl screaming and dropped the roll because with all the action around here, one of our squirrels had had looked at the roll and said, huh, wonder what's in there. And the squirrel was still in there when the kid picked it up. And the squirrel thought, this is not a good idea. So he ran off the guy's hand and, and they were even. Norman was very pleased about this. That's the squirrel. We had last week, we have a brand new bird out, Myra. And our, um, he went into that. He opened it up, and there had been a squirrel in it. And so anyway, you could tell it had been all over the place. It had knocked Shoot. things over. So anyway, and it had been chewing on the floor. So anyway, Art left the the barn open for um, for about an hour. He banged around to get it out, and so he went back last week, and to do some work. And he opened up the barn, and his landscaping boots are right inside. So he grabs the landscaping boots and puts them on. He thought, he thought, oh dear. I left a sock in it, so he reaches out and he pulls the squirrel, the sock out by the tail. Oh, Here's no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh. Yes. oh, my goodness. There was a fellow here from, from Tarbert, where I live, and I, I never met him. I met his wife because um, he died before I got here, so it was kind of hard to reach. But when he was younger, he, they lived on the West Harvard Side Road, about a mile off the Cabot Trail there, and, and he went to work in North Sydney, and they'd go out every, he'd go out Sunday night, and they worked till, till uh, Friday night, and then come home on Friday night with a, with a local fella. And so they didn't have much time at home, but, so the guy came, his ride came to pick him up on, on uh, Sunday evening, going back to North Sydney. Well, how was your weekend, Lockie? Oh, it was good. It was good. Gwenny, glad to see you, was she? Yes, she was, he said. First thing I did was took off my snowshoes. Second thing I did was took off my snowshoes. There, I blew the line. 
That's it. Oh, no. <laughs> Can you remind? No, that's all right. So the second thing he did was take off his snowshoes. Okay. Well, I, yes, I, I neglected. He had to walk from the highway in the winter, walk a mile down the road on his snowshoes. Oh. Was she glad to see you? Yeah, she was. The second thing I did was took off my snowshoes. Yeah. I don't know if it's picking up, but I'm blushing here a little bit. <laughs> I, often, I, I questioned that story, whether it was factual or not, until Angus told me the one that from, uh, from Gwenny, from his wife. And she, at the time, she's about five feet in any direction. Uh, <laughs> wicked sense of humor. And uh, Mu a Angus at the time had a mustache, and Gwenny said to him, you know, I don't think men should have mustaches. Why is that, Gwenny? Because it tickles where it shouldn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost out of stories for now. I don't know what we're going to do in December. <laughs> we can always take a pause, but we'll decide later if you want. Yeah. yeah. Are there any last call from from the uh, pe folks in the gallery? No, it's been quiet in that in the chat room, but people have been listening. I don't know if anyone has any final messages or something that they want to say. Maybe I'll just say thanks to everybody there. I will especially say thank you to Kathy and to Bill and to Ronald. So thanks for sharing stories. A much better way to yeah. spend a uh, windy November night listening to you guys than listening to the radio. I <laughs> so thank you thank did you, you have a, a, a closing closing piece kathy oh oh no i know that's good i'm fine <laughs> okay <laughs> my, i know my friends will, <laughs> will say it was just a, the, the the different stories um right. anyway well i have i, 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 I have one story. more little uh, one more little short one to add then i was in shoppers drug mart over in sydney one time and uh, i was in the line of up to camp and there was an old fella in front of me probably my age but he looked like an old fella and he was the cashier was helping him with his with his transaction taking the putting it in the bag and so on and he said he said you know my wife said to me the other day i have a question for you and i said go ahead shoot she says i thought of it uh-huh so and and that was fine that was that was amusing and then it came to my turn at the cash and she looked at me and said he tells me that story every time he comes in here <laughs> and i thought how sweet is that that you can laugh at the same story to make someone feel good yeah and that's you know when i say good night well mm. you know what sometimes the stories that you know the punchline to are the best ones because they're just good stories <laughs> and when you hear yeah. them I had someone I had told stories and I guess they'd heard it before and they said well it made you feel so good to tell them and I enjoyed them anyway so that's a shout out to one of your librarians Wonderful. She yeah so Darlene Leahy in, the, in Lewisburg said yeah. she'd love to hear my stories so. there we go okay so we'll make sure we get this online um, under the online programs, that's where you'll find it, and it, it is, it'll be the third New Moon story, so that's for everyone to find it again, or share it again, if you have someone, if you know someone who missed tonight, that's great, Kathy, thank you, and I should just say, I don't know, can you guys see the chat box, or is your screen just, um, because there are people, I saw the chat box, did you, okay, yeah. so Kathy, people are sharing, thank you very much, thanks for the great stories, um, Thanks, Kathy. And I read all the good reviews several times. You've seen them all. Okay, so just Kathy, there are lots I'm of just great. looking now. Thank you. Okay, great. perfect. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, storytellers. So this was a great night. Yeah. Thank you.